Okay, everyone, so today we're going to finish off our India series and get to the formation of modern India and some of the things that are impacting in India today. And so let's get right into it. Uh, when last we left off, the British had come to control this area and they played the Muslims and the Hindus off each other and they were a lot stronger militarily. And, you know, that's not to say that the um, Indians didn't try. Every now and again, there would be an armed revolt. Probably the biggest one was known as the Sepoy Revolt of Indian soldiers. Um, Sepoys were Indians that were actually enlisted and trained by the British and would uh, fight as part of the British Army. And they would fight in pretty much every major war that the British wouldn't be involved in, the Crimean War, the um, World War I, World War II. Um, but what had ended up happening is that the British tried to require um, the Indian soldiers to do something that they felt was against their religion, and this was kind of the spark to get the soldiers to try to break free. They had some success early on. They actually took over a couple of cities, although in a couple of those cities they massacred some British women and children, and so Britain decided to bring their entire navy down and then their army, and they were crushed. And so the thought of armed revolt, whereas it seemed like maybe it had a chance, in the end it really wasn't going to be something that worked, and a different path was going to have to be taken. And that was mainly because of the polarization, if you will, between um, Muslims and Hindus. It kept the population divided, so they wouldn't really be able to work together so that they could have success. A guy by the name of Ram Mohan Roy actually started to go against that. He's the guy on the bottom left there. He started a movement to get Indians more organized, to start to get themselves to protest um, a variety of different things that the British were doing. And shortly after his death, something known as the Indian National Congress was formed. And that was actually a legislative body that the British allowed them to have to give suggestions and to try to advise the British on what would make things go better in, um, in India. But they had no real power. The guy that was going to be able to break everything out was Mahatma Gandhi. Um, he was born in the late 1800s, and he was actually educated in law school in London. And he was from the upper class, as you see a picture of him there on the right. That's actually when he was in London. And when he was being uh, schooled in London, he really started to learn about what was going on, about how his people were oppressed, because he was in, from the upper class. So life for him was actually pretty good, but he really started to get exposed to the problems. After uh, England, he actually went to South Africa, which, as we all well know, had the apartheid-type government. And he would write articles about discrimination there and start to bring up how the British, whereas they were building a democracy, these colonies really were um, counterintuitive to that, that they were not in agreement with the government style that they had. Uh, and he actually started causing so many problems in South Africa that they kicked him out. What set him apart is he was one of the first modern-day reformers to use the ideas of nonviolence and civil disobedience. Nonviolence, of course, is that idea. Uh, we talked it all the way back to Jesus Christ um, that you do not ever use violence, even if violence is used against you, uh, that you accept it and perhaps you might even die. But the reason why nonviolence works is that when you see someone beating up someone who isn't fighting back, your first inclination is either to help that person or to figure out why that person isn't fighting back or what is going on. And so by using nonviolence, you're able to expose the issues more and bring more public sentiment against it. If there were some Indians that were on the fence on whether or not they wanted to perhaps put out, push out the British, if they see these people who are being beaten and attacked, which many of them were, um, it could get them to say, look at our people, look at us getting attacked, and, and we need to fight back in a peaceful manner. And the idea of civil disobedience, of course, is breaking unjust laws. 
guys like Martin Luther King Jr. and others, they were inspired by Gandhi. He was the one that got everything going. His biggest act was something known as the Salt March of 1930, in which he marched people to salt flats so that they could take uh, salt and sell it, which the British had forbidden them from doing. And slowly but surely over time, he is going to be able to put enough pressure on the British that in 1947 they leave India. Now, in essence, they probably would have left earlier had it not been for World War II two starting in 1939 sadly he was assassinated in 1948 uh, he was actually assassinated by another hindu he himself is a hindu um, because he was willing to work with and encouraged working with muslims and um, he was shot on his way to prayers um, and he was honored that year actually in 1948 by the nobel peace prize in his honor chose to give no award out to honor his death that is a picture of his funeral. And just some really incredible quotes that how he could get people organized. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And that's what nonviolence is all about. And one of my favorite, an eye for an eye only make only ends up making the whole world blind. And that's what nonviolence was about. Now modern India today, um, was formed in nineteen forty seven and Hindi India was divided up. Uh, for the Hindus and modern-day Pakistan for the Muslims. Unfortunately, these two have gotten over fights over, if you look on the right here, this area, Kashmir. So here's India over here, and this area is under um, being contested by both Pakistan and India. They have fought a couple of different wars, and what makes it a little bit dangerous is both of these the weapon, these weapons, these nations are in possession of nuclear weapons, and so there's a big rivalry with Pakistan. However, in recent years, a lot of the violence has kind of eased back because both of these nations, Pakistan and India, love sports. They're really involved with it, and they've been able to kind of temper some of their uh, violence through sports, most notably both the sports of field hockey and cricket, in which both Pakistan and India have been world champions in, um, and it's a way that they can relieve that tension a little bit. The big thing you got to know about India is its growing economics. It does have the second largest population. It will be number one by 2050, and they are huge on the economic front, okay? They're really big on education, especially if you have money, and we talked about this in class, that they'll send their kids abroad or to any possible school to get them educated. Um, where they're really huge at is telecommunications and computers. Um, they have really gotten involved in the... Um, IT type programs and troubleshooting and the biggest thing is the development of the call center. Uh, it was in India that they developed the idea that you can have one centralized calling center for customer service for a variety of different organizations and all the calls go to India. So I know I have actually called India before for one of the companies that I had to have a question for, and it really gives people lots of different jobs. Um, they're huge in medicine. We've talked about this in class, really pushing the forefront in doctors, and some of the greatest doctors in the world are from India. Um, there are 61 billionaires in the country, and they are the number one producer of cotton and the number two producer in all agriculture in the entire world. This is a nation, as you see by the arrow over here, on the rise. This is Mumbai. This is the financial center of India. And just to give you an idea of how big this is getting, this is the uh, Zwem Balkans Hotel project, which is uh, being built right now. As you can see here, all of these big open area floors and each side of the floor, all these different rooms for people to rent. And each room, you see this thing here, comes with its own separate pool. However, the biggest problem facing India today, and this is important to understand, is poverty. Because of the massive growth in population, there is a huge gap in those who have wealth and those who do not. In some sections of India, as I have here, up to 40% of the people live in poverty, and most of them live on less than $1 per day.
Now, we go back to the caste system causing problems here. Because of the caste system that existed for so long, there's no such thing as social welfare programs or soup kitchens or things that are done to help out the poor. As you see here, this woman is actually walking to find water. She's got a water jug there. And you see she's you know just walking through. The, this is a dump. And right next to it, these over here, these are people's houses that live in a dump. 50% of the people lack proper shelter and 70% lack access to sanitary facilities, proper toilets, piping, fresh water. It's just growing too fast and they're not ready to deal with it. Um, and a lot of it does have to do with educational issues. If you're poor, the likelihood of you getting an education is not particularly high. Um, and the caste system, as I said, particularly in rural areas, is really causing major problems. Um, people don't want to help the poor. There's no such thing as social mobility. And the idea of <clears throat> getting from the top to the bottom just doesn't happen. Um, in total, 37% of the population of India lives in poverty. And when you take 37% of 1.2 billion people, that's a lot of people. The other issue that we see with poverty goes along with this is gender inequity. Women have very few, if any, rights. We talked about the rape issue earlier in class as well, that it wasn't until about last year that they had a strong rape law. There are no laws that require girls to go to school. It's really up to the family. And most girls um, don't get opportunities to get higher education. And in fact, because of the poverty, many um, towns don't have anything more than just a grammar school. And so this poverty is what's really going to be causing problems because the government is going to have to do something and you're going to see this huge disconnect between the haves and the haves nots. If 37% of your country is in poverty, like how is it going to get any better? And that's the big face of India right now. And you can see here Mumbai. So let me jump up real quick, okay? There's Mumbai, right? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Well, on the back end of Mumbai is the tenement section. All of this, look at that. That's all these wood and metal shacks. Okay, you look at some water. Yeah, that's water there. It's just absolutely horrible. And this is what we're talking about. Okay, you can see those people's laundry there. Um, I mean, you have the standing water. There's no sewers. And it's something that's a big deal. We'll get to it more in class, but this is something that needs to get fixed. But nonetheless, in India is a major player in the world. Okay, they have nuclear weapons. They have a huge, powerful army. They're legitimate in sports. Their TV is huge. Uh, they actually produce more movies than the United States of America does. And they're just as huge in sports. Okay, if I jump down real quick, we see here sports is a huge part of society. Field hockey, cricket, and soccer. You know, they, they are just as intense about sports as we are. Okay, and I'm going to skip over that. You can look at that later. And then the other big thing that they have is Bollywood. Um, this is based in Mumbai, which was called Bombay, so they call it Bollywood. Um, a lot of the movies they have are about music and dancing. It's a lot of fun. Pretty much all of the movies are PG, very, very strict um, because of the religions, both Islam and Hinduism. You know, you're not going to be seeing nudity and cursing. Um, but what you are going to see is dancing and bright colors, and it's really the number one movie industry in the entire world. Um, and in the last 10 years, it's spread all over the world. You, many of you might have even seen the movie Slumdog Millionaire that had a little bit of Bollywood in it. <clears throat> and so India, in many ways, is just like us. Yes, they have problems and there's diseases and poverty, but they're on the rise and they're a modern nation, a nation that's really going to play into us in the future. All right, so make sure you get those three comments and five questions, and I'll see you guys soon.